Welcome here. So my name is uh, Fabrice Bernhard. I'm speaking in the mic for the video. Um, so I'm going to tell you the story which started a year ago when I met quite by chance uh, a CIO of a uh, important French bank. I'm, I'm not going to name it, not because they asked me not to name it, but because I didn't bother asking them the permission. And so for uh, uh, obvious reasons, I will just uh, keep the name secret. So uh, I met the CIO of a huge French bank, and um, he was looking for a startup to help him uh, improve his methodologies of development. And we we happened to meet him because uh, I'm the um, I'm the CTO and co-founder of a tech startup called Theodo, and we do um, agile web development mainly in PHP, Symfony, and Node.js, Angular. Uh, we've been re going really fast, 300% um, growth in the last two years, um, Yeah, growing from about 10, 15 to 50. And the key factor of success, uh, as much in the way we uh, convince our clients to work with us and in the way we manage to uh, cope with the growth, is agile culture. <coughs> so, what was the, why did a CIO of a large bank actually want to uh, meet a startup. Um, the idea behind it is that um, we're right in the middle of a digital revolution, uh, which is of course very a lot of fun and very exciting for uh, startups like us, but which is really scary for large organizations. This graph, just, just to show you how scary it can be, you can see in red the growth of Walmart in the first 17 years of its existence. Uh, uh, Walmart, which is still by far the leader in retail in the States, I think it's uh, six times bigger than Amazon. It's still six times bigger than Amazon, but if you now look in yellow at the growth rate of Amazon in the first 17 years of their existence, you can see that it is so much faster that Walmart has good reasons to be scared if they uh, 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 about this digital revolution. And this di why why is this uh, why can we call it a revolution? I think it's because uh, there's a, a fundamental paradigm that has changed, which is that it's not the big companies that eat the small as it used to be. It's now the fast that eat the slow. And uh, and the fast are really fast. So if you take a traditional organization um, where in an IT department people are used to uh, deploying. Um, the, I don't know, uh, application evolutions um, once in a while, usually less than once a month. And now you compare it to um, leading tech startups in the web. You have, for example, Facebook, which is able to deploy twice a day, even though they have this amazingly large infrastructure and really complex, dynamic and interrelated application. For um, you, other startups, we are Netflix and Etsy, they, they claim to deploy more than 30 times a day. So that means that multiple times an hour, there's a team somewhere in the company deploying an evolution on, in production. And to take the example I was giving you just before, Amazon. Amazon, they have an average uh, time between deployments of 11 seconds. So they basically, every 11 seconds, there's a team somewhere in Amazon deploying a live feature in production. Um, as a side note, uh, because when I, uh, when I heard about this number, I thought, wow, this is really, this is uh, uh, very huge. Uh, they must be counting uh, really small deployments, maybe in the you know, administration panel, things like that. Uh, so I have a second number for that. The average deployment at Amazon impacts 10,000 servers. So every 11 seconds, Amazon is, on average, impacting 10,000 servers. So I, I unfortunately have never impacted 10,000 servers myself, at least once in my life. And Amazon is doing that every 11 seconds. So when you see the gap between an organization that is used to say, thinking that once a month is a lot and an organization where the average is every 10 seconds, you understand why they go so much faster, why they learn so much faster, and why, of course, they can uh, uh, be that scary for a large organization. Well, the good news that I, ha that I have for large organizations is that uh, 
the secret behind the success is actually quite easy to uh, learn about uh, uh, because it's public. Uh, if you, you want to know how they do fast development, well, Scrum is a methodology that is completely open and that is very well documented. You want to learn uh, the tricks, the tools and the, co the process they use to do fast deployment, well, DevOps is again a very open culture with with people sharing their knowledge a lot, and uh, and and it's it's no no secret behind it. Um, you want to understand why they do all this? Uh, what is the and what are the ideas behind it? Well, it's it's nothing secret again. It's mostly um, uh, ideas taken from the lean um, uh, philosophy and. Uh, there's a, a really nice book that actually sums it up in a more digital environment, which is the Lean Startup. So if you want to change, it's actually uh, quite easy to learn how what, what you could aim for. Now, of course, the big problem for large organizations is that they're really resilient. <coughs> Small teams are able to adopt new methodologies. So that's how you uh, really when Scrum became fashionable at, at the beginning of 2000, you saw, uh, you saw lots of teams in large organizations uh, adopting uh, Scrum. Um, and for you, I have got examples at Orange, uh, for example, but uh, many, many others using post-its, doing, um, doing, of course, uh, stand-up meetings every morning and, and, and sprints every two weeks or things like that. The problem is that uh, uh, the, the, uh, as much as a, sw a small team is able to change really quickly, the problem of big organization is that the, f is that this, the, the, the relationship between these teams is very resistant to change. And, um, and a really interesting uh, idea, usually you think it's just because people don't have the will for that or they're, they're not smart enough to do, to do the change. Um, that's why I really like the book that I've uh, shown you on the side, which is The Innovator's Dilemma, because it really, um, it is at the same time reassuring and scary for managers. It shows that if large organizations are so resilient and uh, so, so uh, resistant, actually not resilient, <laughs> yeah, they come back to their initial state, are, are so resistant to change, it's not because they're badly managed, it's actually because they're really well managed. And therefore, the whole organization, every small team is able to 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 is is really focused on what he has always done well, and what the client wants. So if the client is not asking for a change, if the client is not asking for uh, something really uh, uh, is is didn't uh, ask anything different, then even if at the top of the organization you decide you should do things differently, the the whole small teams in your organization will continue to do to do the way they've always done because they know the client is happy this way. This is where the resistance comes from. So this is why one of the big ideas behind the innovator's dilemma is that if you want to bring disruptive innovation in your organization that is not um, asked for by your clients, then the only mm, way that has been observed that works is creating an independent team which, is, uh, which must be highly polyvalent because it has to be able to produce everything they need on their own and to try this new approach or this new innovation. <coughs> so that's how, when I, that's how I got actually involved in, in the story of trying to introduce DevOps in, in a large French bank. So it all started around the lunch uh, at uh, this pub, which is really near here, quite nice uh, recommendation. Um, where we met by chance because we were we had become known for uh, our skills and agility and the CIO of this French bank wanted to meet uh, agile teams um, so we have lunch thinking it would be just a you know a, 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 an interesting debate about uh, agility and the differences between small and large organizations and it ends up right away in uh, the beginning of a collaboration and the idea is to create this independent team um, uh, coming with this really innovative culture, different culture, and try to somehow do it on at the side of the normal organization, but in the same building. So the plan is, okay, no PowerPoints. We're not there to, cons to do consulting and look at how people do things and tell them how they should do things. No, the idea is to build something. 
So we, we need to find an app that is easy to, de to develop and try to develop it in our way inside the organization. The, um, the other part of the plan is, of course, that we, we expect to be slowed down many, many times. So we know we have the ability to escalate very, very high in case of slowdowns. The, for this, for two reasons. First, of course, to manage to um, create this app. And, and the second point is that it, every time we do that, we're actually in identifying a bottleneck in the current organization. And the idea is to um, be aware that it will be very difficult, but be in a, uh, in a continuous improvement mindset and try to improve things every week uh, a little more. So, yeah, as I told you, so we, that's how we start and we go there as a separate team, but on site. And now is the list of problems coming. So the problem number one, which was... Uh, very unexpected is that we needed to find a product owner for the app. So we had identified an app which was quite interesting. It was the um, internal directory. Um, so basically um, the way to find uh, employees contact information inside the organization. The current application was uh, well was designed for Internet Explorer 6, so it was still compatible with Internet Explorer 8, but just the design and everything was, was really horrible. So the idea was to use the uh, mobile excuse to redo this app in a mobile way. Of course, do it in a responsive way, so that once people would start uh, using it and adopting it, and realizing it actually also worked on desktop, they would stop using the uh, current app and start adopting ours. So Perfect. We know we know the, the app we want to build. We know the team that is in charge of um, of this current application. So we should be able to find a product owner. Well, that was quite a huge political issue because large organizations are really not familiar with the concept of one person with uh, decision power. So um, first uh, escalation, uh, we finally force a poor woman to be the product owner, and. Uh, <laughs> So she's not really uh, happy about it. But the good thing about agility in general is that once you try it, you usually like it very much. And, um, and she actually, after a few weeks, was able to really enjoy the idea of, of, uh, of giving ideas to a team of developers and seeing the ideas uh, created in real time, every day, new features. So once you force a product owner, the good thing is he usually likes it and, and wants to stay. So the second problem, very unexpected again, but there were actually no computers. Because you can't bring that easily, your own computer, in a large bank. Uh, if you want to use the uh, normal computers, they're really horrible for developers. So we, th this was the mindset we were in. We, w we didn't want to settle so easily. So it's not because that's the way they are. It will just take the first Windows small computer with like 15 inch screen. So we escalated once again. Uh, and uh, asked for cool computers that developers would, uh, would, um, would be happy with, and uh, with Linux, and with a real internet connection, and not something behind like horrible firewalls that you can't even watch anything on YouTube or, or, or any interesting information that you could look for. Yeah, because the, the amazing thing about these firewalls is that they're, they're basically w whitelisted. So, uh, Everything you're looking for, which is outside of the three or four or, you know, main websites they like, you, you can't find it. So uh, we escalated for uh, the computers and we escalated for uh, the internet connection. So we finally had a, a bad live box connection in, in our office. Um, we were quite, um, we knew we could do this because we had already seen it done. I can't say in which company, but I had seen a really cool team, uh, quite disruptive, in a really large uh, uh, French company who also had their own live box arriving in the middle of their office. So we knew this is something that can be done. So yeah, with high escalation, which is quite sad for such a, a petty issue, so, uh, we managed to have uh, things solved in a matter of weeks. And, um, and actually the CIO was really happy to know how Stupid it was to just get a computer with two large screens. So problem number three, everything is forbidden. So that was kind of expected, uh, but not to that level, of course, because um, in a large organization, um, 
you have this horrible security debate. Deb security is a really it's a difficult issue because it's about rare events. So it's hard to rationalize the debate. You can't, you know, usually in agility you say, you say when there's a debate, let's try to um, uh, transform it into, uh, uh, oh, I'm lacking the, f the English word right now. But you're trying to see it as a standard deviation. You're like, wh what is deviating from which standard? What are the hypotheses that you are, that we're arguing about? to try to rationalize the debate as much as you can. In security, where things are uh, really rare, it's ba there's much more belief involved in a debate, which is quite complicated. And security usually has a lot of power to say no, but no incentive to find solutions. Um, and <laughs> security is an excuse for so many people to uh, get involved in you, into your project and to uh, you know, have pleasure in, in bothering you. So, of course, you've got the InfoSec teams, uh, which you expected, but you also have the legal department and the HR department, and of course the threat of trade unions, and you know, everybody is uh, threatening you of, uh, with security issues. So, the solution we found, um, and, I'm, um, and that was, that is, I'm, I guess, one of the main points uh, I learned from this experience, is that we managed to have a really brilliant head of InfoSec involved in the project and he was actually coming to our weekly retrospective uh, uh, yeah, every time. So once you have somebody who's got the experience of what, uh, uh, how the organization works and where the security threats will come from, um, uh, have somebody who's uh, rational enough to, um, to, to have like, interesting debates with and he's able to explain with, like, uh, with pedagogy why things are really impossible and why things are actually doable. Then you have a real ally and, and he can be actually the main person driving the innovation. Because usually when you see that the whole organization is, uh, is scared about security, even though they're not specialists in it, so once you have the security expert saying, no, no, that's fine, then ev everything is easier. Okay, so now we have a team working and uh, a few security um, solutions. So the problem number four, once we wanted to put in production, is there is simply no server. So the normal delay for getting a server is um, unbelievable. Uh, it's a matter of months. Um, so uh, basically, I still don't really understand why. But uh, one of the main reasons it was so slow is because we w we were doing a mobile application. So by by doing something mobile, we wanted to have we wanted it to be um, available on the internet and not just on the intranet. So basically, their excuse was if you had asked for an intranet server, it would have been a matter of weeks. But you're asking for an internet server. This is crazy. This is a matter of months. So once again, very high escalation, and the result is it uh, didn't work. So this is the big fail of this uh, of this experience is that the only way to actually get access to a server in a quick way was to steal somebody else's server. <laughs> yeah, That's why I'm not naming the bank. Uh, <laughs> so uh, basically a project, and um, we, we, we actually went to apologize to this project for uh, stealing the servers and they actually thanked us for it. So we didn't really understand why. But basically they said thanks to our really high escalation, uh, we managed to con provision, configure the server in a matter of days when they were expecting a few more months, so that was perfect for them. And then now we're, I still think we're still sharing the server together, which is crazy. So, of course, a solution I'm, I'm advoca advocating for is uh, basically infrastructure as a service um, with solutions like OpenStack. I don't understand why uh, large organizations haven't um, uh, adopted it sooner. So basically, and, and, and the bank strategy, this is planned for uh, end of 2015. I hope this will work. And the huge, huge issues I've, I've um, observed uh, concerning uh, infrastructure as a service is that there's a real security paradigm um, based on let's create the biggest Maginot line in front uh, between the internet and the intranet. And, so th and therefore, it's not the infrastructure as a service which will solve everything because it will still be seen as a security threat to have access to any server inside the intranet because they consider that once you're in the intranet, everything is unsafe. Um, it would be, of course, much, much better if the, um, 
the, 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 the infrastructure had been designed in a way that every server is well secured. The way, of course, an Amazon works, where every server is is comes with its firewall, which is um, configured uh, outside the server. So yeah, this is a quote from Lean Startup that, uh, when I reread it, uh, really sounded important, <laughs> uh, really actual to me. Um, if you want to create this innovation inside a large organization, your startup team needs to be completely cross-functional and especially um, every functional department in the company that will be involved needs to be on board. And that's where we had this, that's why it didn't work in our case, because the um, infrastructure, infrastructure team was actually not uh, uh, inside, the, uh, inside enough. And it finishes by, you have to be able to ship uh, functioning products and not just prototypes, which is what we ended up in a way doing. Problem number five, okay, now we have a server, we want to deploy fast, so SSH is forbidden. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, we, we are so used to deploying through uh, Fabric, Capistrano, using SSH that we really didn't have uh, a, any idea how we could do differently. Um, so we're still struggling on that one. We have went to uh, sending packages by email to some guy somewhere who ships it then to India and then installs it on the server or something like that, to doing approximately the same, at least when I would the installation of the packages is automated using Ansible. So Ansible is, is quite a nice tool because you can automate local installation and uh, remote installation, which means that for the moment it's it's used as a local installation, but it could be really easily used to, uh, as a remote installation if one day we get SSH access to, the, to some servers. So this, these are the main problems I've uh, come across in, the, uh, in these uh, yeah, one year of uh, trying to bring more DevOps in, in these organizations. So what are the lessons learned? The take home message, so first, um, yeah, get very, very high sponsorship. Um, in our case, the CIO we were talking to was, I've got a laser pointer, is here. But if this managed to work in a way, because it's considered a success uh, by, by, by the bank for the moment, this is because we even had like sponsorship from the executive committee here. So this is, this is the, the sad thing I would say about large organizations in France. I don't know how, how, how true it is uh, uh, in other countries. But um, the way they've, been, they've organized the whole bank is that you have like these huge departments of developers, then you have one very, very huge department of operations, and uh, the person above the two is directly in the executive committee, and as of course um, is a brilliant person, uh, but there's really no technical knowledge, uh, so is unable to understand um, what DevOps could mean outside of uh, very high level considerations. So this means that she is relying on the head of here and the head of here to be friends to each other and try to collaborate, which is somewhat, somewhat happening, but of course uh, maybe not as fast as it could. Um, so the second, uh, second lesson learned is that uh, um, all the time I've spent at DevOps days or DevOps meetups or Velocity conferences uh, was actually really valuable because all the success stories I've learned about were as many arguments to prove to people that, we, that it was achievable. Um, one, of the, um, one of my favorite stories, but I have many more, was um, the uh, Digital Government Service Initiative in the UK where the people were able, thanks to sponsorship from the Prime Minister's cabinets, were able to merge all digital websites from the government into one really, really agile team. Um, a team which is um, deploying, I think, 20 or 30 times a day, kind of a DevOps measurement. And they've done all that in one year. So if, if the English, the UK government is able to do that, then any large organization is able to do that with uh, very high political sponsorship. Um, I would say that one of the requirements, lesson learned, is that hosting should be set as a prerequisite. I think we would have had more power to um, improve uh, 
the infrastructure uh, offer that we've had to struggle with if it had been a prerequisite at the beginning of the project. If we had realized how much we needed to involve the uh, infrastructure team in the, in, in the beginning, uh, etc., etc. Um, so yeah, the, and, and one aspect, because this is what happens in this large organization, the security issues around the target infrastructure is that you get the server, but whatever is around the server, so how much access do you have to other sensitive servers in the infrastructure, that should be completely transparent to, uh, the, to the team, because I, I don't care that once I'm on the server, I can attack the whole bank. That's not my issue. You just you know, put walls around, do whatever you want, or put me somewhere else. Um, well, one of the success uh, uh, I told you about, and this is one of the big lessons too, is that it uh, involve a security uh, manager, somebody who's, uh, who can take uh, decisions, um, bec um, because he will be the best ally, because security is the main bottleneck in a large organization. Yeah, um, I'm, um, one of the books that is recommended on uh, DevOps uh, transformation is the Phoenix Project. Uh, it's really it's it's a story, so it's really easy to read and, and very very um, captivating. Um, and in this book too, you see the, the the how the security is first seen as a as an enemy and becomes an ally. And I think this is one uh, one important idea. Um, one of the things that worked really well is the re weekly retrospective with the stakeholders. Um, there are so many stakeholders in large organizations, so many different incentives. Um, but it's also all about human interaction. So once you get everyone on board with a one hour per week meeting, when you start becoming, um, yeah, know, knowing each other, then things work so much better. Um, if you want them to work even better, then there's a really nice book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which explains to you, which, explain, well, which gives you tricks to make teams work really efficiently. Um, the main one is, of course, to create trust and then encourage conflict. Um, that is one of my, one of the things I didn't expect, the good news I didn't expect is that actually a constructive conflict happened really easily. So I don't know why, was it, was it because the, the members of the team were particularly uh, uh, good or maybe the, this is part of the organization, but at least that worked quite well. Um, simple, useful targets, uh, simple because even in a large organization, if you want to do something simple in a DevOps way, this is already like the biggest challenge ever. And useful because, and that's what happened with our internal directory, is that once people start using it, give you feedback, and you can improve it multiple times a day, and they can see it improving in, in real time, then you prove the point of DevOps. So, of course, if it's useless and you have no users, then it was just uh, um, not a good idea. Um, one of the things that we've um, realized a bit late, but which is starting to work, is bring the startup culture. Because DevOps adoption is a lot about cultural change, um, and you need to embrace it. And uh, if you want to embrace it, uh, let's use the, uh, let's bring fun to it. I mean, startup culture is very different from uh, usually large organizations' culture, and, 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 and there's no reason to not bring it with the DevOps adoption. So we brought decoration with posters like this one. We had to, uh, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know, but maybe trade unions were not uh, were against that, but we we just did it. We now we have weekly morning stand-up meetings. We have brown bag lunches every week. We have cool computers, and yeah, you can see like there's a, there's a lot of things to eat in the in the small space that is assigned to the to the team, and yeah, we're making it. Um, we're making it desirable to do the same, which is, I think, a good thing. The next improvements, because the, it was, it's considered a success. From my point of view, there's a lot to improve still. I would say that the, the, ne the next steps for improvements will be um, infrastructure as a service. Um, I still don't know why it's so hard to adopt OpenStack. I think there's a lot of polit politics involved into that, because there is a cloud uh, solution that is being adopted, but you know, with a really long-term plan. And one of the things apparently that would, would solve our issues is virtual networks. So I'm not really good at, um, at networking, but basically 
from what I got is we have access to too many servers from our production server and now the, the idea is that there's a real change that is transparent to us where they will fortunately um, make fences between different networks and there will be uh, a, a zone which, which will be safer for uh, applications like ours which are not really that... Uh, oh, that's me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there's one thing that we, <laughs> okay, that this didn't happen. So virtual networks could be a solution to many of our problems by creating a zone where we can finally deploy without uh, having everybody involved. Red Hat 7 and uh, 3.10 kernel basically could bring Docker adoption. Um, and that could be interesting, um, especially because um, so Docker for me was just you know no, uh, uh, yet another way to virtualize things. But in a large organization, what it could be bring, uh, which could be really interesting, is basically we could package, we could provision our application inside our container the way we want it, and then just send the container. And maybe that could be compatible with the current processes, and while giving us the full power to provision our container the way we want it. So that's why I'm. I think this could be made. This could bring maybe. A, really different ways of uh, 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 to accelerate things. And the big uh, um, thing we're working on right now is level two support. So what happens when there's a problem in production in the application? Uh, basically, who, who wakes up at night uh, and, and solves it? And well, this is a really DevOps uh, problem and we're working on it right now to know where the, these people will be, uh, will be in the organization. Thank you very much for listening to this.